Hello all, welcome to KU Paatshala. Today we'll be looking at a poem called Toish, a Laguna Coyote Story by Leslie Marmon Silko. This poem is prescribed for the S5 English degree students under the Post-Colonial Literatures in English paper. I'm Dr. Shruti Ramachandran, Assistant Professor of English, Government College for Women, Tiruvananthapuram. So let us begin the presentation. This presentation is titled, Toish, A Laguna Coyote Story, A Critical Reading. And this is how we will go about it. I will briefly introduce the writer, the poet, Leslie Marmon Silko. Then we will move on to a discussion of the significance of the coyote. Then we will read the poem, Toish, A Laguna Coyote Story. Then we will move on to an analysis of the poem. And then finally, to the conclusion. Now, let us look at the poet, Leslie Marmon Silko. So here you have a picture of the poet. Now, she is a key figure in the first wave of what is known as the Native American Renaissance. Now, this is a term that was coined by Kenneth Lincoln. She, along with many native writers, is one of the key figures of this particular Renaissance. Now, Leslie Marmon Silko is of a mixed race Laguna Pueblo ancestry. She, however, strongly identifies with her Laguna Pueblo roots. Now, Laguna Pueblo is Spanish for the lake people. She was heavily influenced by her grandparents who were great storytellers. So what we see in her works is a lot of Laguna myth, storytelling traditions, a lot about the native culture. She, along with many other writers of the Native American Renaissance, were very much concerned about the isolation and alienation of the Native Americans in white society. And they also uh, talked about the importance of Native traditions and community in modern life. Some of her works include Laguna Women, which is a collection of poems, Ceremony, which is a highly acclaimed novel. Now, Ceremony is quite famous in America and it is also a part of a school curriculum. Storyteller, which is a collection of short stories and poems. Sacred Water, which is a mix of autobiographical prose, poetry and Pueblo mythology. And then you have a collection of her essays titled Yellow Woman and a Beauty of the Spirit. Then she has also published a memoir titled The Turquoise Ledge. Now, this is a picture of the coyote. Now, you can see an animal which looks very close to a fox. And coyotes are quite common and they are very important as far as the Native American uh, storytelling tradition goes. We move on to a discussion of the significance of the coyote. Now, Toish is a Pablo, uh, a Laguna Pueblo word for the coyote. Now, Coyote is a well-known trickster figure. Trickster figures figure quite prominently in Native American writing. Some of the other trickster figures are Hare, Raven, Blue Jay, the Spider, etc. Now, Coyote tales are extremely popular in the Native American tradition, especially Coyote as a trickster is very popular in the plains. Now, the Laguna Pueblo people, they belong to the plains. Uh, they are part of New Mexico in America. Now, the coyote is important for the Navajos, which is another tribe. It is part of the creation myth of the Navajos. The coyote causes the flood. Coyote originates death and interferes with the stars, according to the Navajo mythology. Coyote is also regarded as a rude and interfering and restless individual who is basically going about poking his nose into everybody's business. Yet, the coyote is an important part of the creation. It is vital to the process of ordered creation. The coyote is a devil, a fool, a creator of the world. In fact, it could be an upsetting factor. It breaks through the notion of what a deity ought to be. So the coyote or the representation of coyote can range from the mythic uh, to the evil to the trickster. The trickster tales have a lesser sacred quality than the creation myths. Now the Pueblo cultures see the coyote as a trickster figure. 
Their tales are basically about the foolishness, the mischievousness and the occasionally disastrous activities of the coyote. Now, some of the characteristics of a typical trickster figure is that they would be greedy, vain, foolish, cunning and occasionally they can also display a high a degree of power. Now, coyote transcends boundaries. Coyote moves between the categories of humans, gods and animals. Basically, it is an essential being in the world who represents a force, a vital force of restlessness and energy. Coyote has also been used for, as a vehicle for a description of a wide range of topics. The coyote stories demonstrating possibilities and limitations in the world. Now coming to our poem, Toish, a Laguna Coyote story. Uh, Toish, as I said earlier, is, the, is a Laguna word for coyote. This poem has a dedication. It is for Simon J. Ortis. Now, Simon J. Ortis belongs to the Acoma people, and he is one of the other prominent writers of the Native American Renaissance. So this is a dedication from a fellow poet to a contemporary uh, writer. Uh, I would first read the poem once, and then we will move on to an analysis of the poem. So here goes. In the winter time, at night, we tell coyote stories and drink spanada by the stove. How coyote got his ratty old fur, bits of old fur the sparrows stuck on him with dabs of pitch. That was after he lost his proud original one in a poker game. Anyhow, things like that are always happening to him. That's what he said anyway. And it happened to him at Laguna and Chinle and Lukachukai too because Coyote got too smart for his own good. But the Navajos say he won a contest once. It was to see who could sleep out in a snowstorm the longest, and Coyote waited until Chipmunk, Badger and Skunk were all curled up under the snow, and then he uncovered himself and slept all night inside. And before morning, he got up and went out again and waited until the others got up before he came in to take the prize. Some white men came to Akoma and Laguna a hundred years ago, and they fought over Akoma land and Laguna women. And even now, some of their descendants are howling in the hills southeast of Laguna. Charlie Coyote wanted to be a governor, and he said that when he got elected, he would run the other men off the reservation and keep all the women for himself. One year, the politicians got fancy at Laguna. They went door to door with hams and turkeys, and they gave them to anyone who promised to vote for them. On election day, all the people stayed home and ate turkey and laughed. The Transwestern Pipeline Vice President came to discuss right of way. The Lagunas let him wait all day long because he is a busy and important man. And late in the afternoon, they told him to come back again tomorrow. They were after the picnic foot that the special dancers left down below the cliff. And Toish and his cousins hung themselves down over the cliff, holding each other's tail in their mouth, making a coyote chain, until someone in the middle farted. And the guy behind him opened his mouth to say, what stinks? And they all went tumbling down like that. Howling and roaring, Toish scattered white people out of bars all over Wisconsin. He bumped into them at the door until they said, excuse me. And the way Simon meant it was for 300 or maybe 400 years. So that is the poem. Now we move on to the analysis of the poem. Now, the poem begins with a reference to winter time. Now, winter time is a non-linear concept of time, which is very common with the Native American people. So for them, time is always cyclical. So winter time is a reference to that, to a non-linear time. And here we have a picture of storytelling. Stories of coyote are being shared uh, by the tribesmen and tribeswomen. They sit around a stove listening to coyote stories, drinking this non-alcoholic drink called the Spanada. It is a picture of warmth. It is a picture of leisure, listening to trickster tales, sipping Spanada. 
Now, it is a story, a very interesting story of how Coyote got his ratty old dirty fur. And it is not his original fur coat. This was actually pasted upon him with dabs of pitch. Pitch is a resin that comes out from the conifer tree. Now, this was attached to him by the sparrow. So, this is the story. And where, like one story typically leads to another story in Native American cultures. So from that story, we are taken to another story of how Coyote actually lost his original fur. This was in a poker game. Now, the poker game reference implies the greed of the coyote. Coyotes are known to be greedy. And uh, so one tale leading to another, and as uh, Leslie Marmon Silken, uh, Silko her, her, her calls it, it is a spider web of cultures that we can find in such stories. Now, the coyote fur coat story leads to another story about the poker game and the coyote losing his original fur coat in a poker game. Then we move on to uh, how this is a common occurrence for the coyote. He's always in trouble. He's a consistent trouble seeker. Even among the Navajos, he is known to be a trouble seeker. And he is too intelligent for his own good. His cunning gets the better of him and it lands him up in trouble most of the time. So that is what is happening to Coyote all the time. He gets into trouble everywhere. Now, sometimes Coyote also gets away with his schemes. And there is a Navajo tale about how uh, he actually wins a contest. Now, there is a sleep out competition among the animals. And the competition is all about who can sleep the longest outside in a snowstorm. And the coyote and the others, the others are the animals like chipmunk, badger and skunk. They all start the competition by sleeping outside and the scheming coyote, do you know what he does? He goes inside. While all the other animals are sleeping, coyote goes inside, sleeps peacefully inside and then before they wake up, the coyote comes out and claims his price. So this is what the coyote is all about. You know, he has no qualms about being righteous when it comes to getting his way. So this is a picture of uh, you know, tales being told, stories being shared among the native tribesmen about the coyote. And then quite abruptly, the writer moves away from the stories to uh, an abrupt dis description of the white settlers. So this is what we have in the next uh, stanza. So what we have to remember about this particular poem is that there is no one-to-one -one logical connection between the stanzas. The common binding theme is the coyote. So next we have quite an abrupt description of the white settlers. Now the poet talks about how these white settlers came to the Laguna and Acoma lands and exploited the lands and the people, especially the women. And you have a generation of uh, children who belonged to uh, mixed race ancestry because of the exploitations of the white man. Now, uh, she, the poet writes that some of their descendants are howling in the hills southeast of Laguna even today. And when she talks about the descendants of the white man, uh, the poet herself is of a mixed breed ancestry. Now this is what she says, I am of mixed breed ancestry, but what I know is Laguna. She strongly identifies with her Laguna ancestry. Now, when she makes that comment about the descendants of the white men howling in the hills, she's being self-referential here because it includes the poet herself. Now, she moves on to a description of Charlie Coyote, who wanted to be a governor. Now, Charlie Coyote is an interesting uh, being. He has an unconventional campaign propaganda. And the propaganda is, if he wins, if he gets elected, he would keep all the women in the reservation for himself and run the men off the reservation. So this is quite an interesting uh, unconventional campaign propaganda that he has. And here, the coyote is this amorous lover, or he represents the amorous lover who plans to have his way with the clan's woman. Now, this reference is also to another short story by Silko herself called Coyote Holds a Full House in His Hand. So there you have the coyote uh, trying to have his way with the women of the clan. So it is a reference to that. And here you have Charlie Coyote who wants to keep the women for himself and run the men off the reservation if at all he gets elected. So it is also a way of ridiculing the politicians and their uh, you know, lopsided policies regarding Native Americans. 
Now, in keeping with the theme of the politicians and their business, uh, the poet moves on to, uh, to uh, describe a door-to-door -door campaign that the politicians made among the Laguna people. This was, they started distributing hams and turkeys for the promise of vote. So this is what uh, the, the politicians ended up doing. And do you know what happens on the election day? The people, they eat all the food very happily and they stay at home the election day. They do not go out and vote. They have a hearty meal and a heartier laugh. So here, Toish manifests himself in the Laguna people. Now, Toish is symbolic of the courageous, adaptive survival skills of Native America as a whole. So here, Toish is being one of the Native people himself, themselves. So uh, Toish can manifest himself as the Native Americans. Then uh, you have, a dis from, the p from, from the arena of politics, we move on to a capitalistic cooperative system, uh, a corporate system that the writer goes on, that the poet goes on to describe. So here, the corporate system is exemplified by the Transwestern Pipeline. Now, this is a project that cuts across Native American lands. Now, um, it's, uh, it's has created a lot of discussion among the public in general because it is exploitative in nature. Now here we have a description of how the vice president of Trans Western Pipeline uh, wanted to meet the elders of the tribe to discuss right of way. Now the natives understand that this is a mere PR exercise and nothing is going to come out of the discussion uh, which will actually benefit the native people. So they are aware, they are fully aware, the Lagunas are fully aware of the uh, vice president's intentions and so what do they do? They keep him waiting all day and then they tell him to come the next day. This is because the vice president does not have a reciprocal relationship with the land. He only exploits it ruthlessly. So here, when they, the native people are humiliating the vice president, it is the coyote manifesting as the native people. So the they there ref, uh, refers to the natives and the coyote being one of them. So coyote manifests as one among the natives as they humiliate the vice president. Now, from that passage, uh, from that stanza, we move on to the next stanza, which again begins with they. So you have a day ending the previous uh, stanza and then you have another day beginning the next stanza. Here, the day refers to the coyote and his cousins uh, who are greedy for the picnic food the special dancers have left down the cliff. Now what we see there is a brilliant juxtaposition of the vice president and the greedy toish stealing food. So it's a very brilliant way of connecting the two. Coyote is always greedy and it craves human food. It likes human food and like humans, the coyote is not averse to stealing. So it, it, uh, he and his cousins are out to get the food, the picnic food. Now the coyote can occur as a multiple of himself. So you have not just Toish, you also have another set of coyotes which includes his cousins. So Toish and his cousins, they make a coyote chain down the cliff to steal the picnic food. And how do they achieve this? They are hanging down with each other's tails in their mouths. So you have to pictureize this. You know, you, you have a, a group of coyotes, each holding uh, the, the other's tail in their mouths, trying to form a chain so that they can go down the cliff and steal all the picnic food. So while they are doing this, while there is an attempt to steal the food, one of the coyote in the middle farts. And then what happens? The one behind him opens his mouth to ask what stinks. And you can imagine what happens next. They all come tumbling down. So this is what happens to the coyote. So the coyote is also likely to be fooled himself as to trick others. So he may be smart, he may be cunning, he may be, uh, uh, you know, schemy, but then he's also a fool at times. The last stanza uh, where you, the poet talks about the coyote howling and screaming, uh, Toish particularly, Toish howling and uh, scre uh, uh, roaring, scattering white people out of the bars all over Wisconsin. So you have uh, the 
Toish creating a lot of commotion and noise, scattering white people out of bars all over Wisconsin. Now, Wisconsin is close to, um, uh, you know, it's more than 2,000 2, kilometers away from New Mexico. But then the reference to Wisconsin could be because it was uh, the venue of the writing conference the poet had attended just before writing this particular poem. So that could be the reference to Wisconsin. And also the scattering, the scattering of the white people could be a reference to the scattering of the stars myth, which is a mythic motif of the coyote. So it could be a reference to that as well. And Wisconsin being the venue of the writing conference that the poet had attended. So you have the coyote, you know, scattering the white people out of bars all over Wisconsin. So you have uh, probably a reference to the kind of people that the a poet encountered in Wisconsin, people who, uh, white people especially, who may have not had any idea of what Native American traditions are all about or Native American writing is all about. So the coyote there stands at the door. So the positioning of the coyote is important. He's neither in nor out. So he's somewhere in between. And what does the coyote do? He purposely stands there bumping against the white people until they get fed up and they ask, and they say, excuse me. So this is what the coyote does. You know, he stands there deliberately with the white people bumping against him, making them say, excuse me. Now, it could be that the coyote wants attention. It is attention seeking. He wants his presence to be felt. Uh, the coyote lacks visibility. Coy by coyote, by extension, it could be the Native American. The Native American uh, wants recognition. He lacks visibility and seeks recognition and wants to be acknowledged. And this is exactly what has been denied to them for a very long time. And that is what the coyote represents. He stands there in between, bumping deliberately, you know, making others notice his presence. And the writers here, including uh, Silco and uh, Simon J. Ortis, they were all very much concerned about the alienation of the white Americans, in, uh, sorry, the Native Americans in white society. And it was a major concern of the Native American writer. There were, there were attempts to rediscover and revivify a uniquely Indian identity. So this is what all the writers wanted. And the Native American has been striving for visibility, acknowledgement and acceptability for a long time now. And as the poem concludes with a reference to Simon again, Simon here could be the writer himself, uh, the Native American writer who also a knows that this is what has been happening to the Native American. There is no visibility. There is no acknowledgement. And what exists are mere tokenisms. So he also understands that uh, um, things need to be done for the Native American. And there, are, there, they, they have, there has to be serious attempts to reclaim their uh, uh, rights over the land and uh, uh, you know, a claim for visibility. That is what the writers would say. And that is how the uh, poet chooses to end this particular poem. And uh, again, with a reference to another Native American poet, Simon J. Ortis. So this is what the poem is all about. And to conclude, uh, Leslie Marmon Silko's poem has a wide ranging treatment of the coyote. Now it is a story of not just the coyote, it is a story of the Laguna Pueblo. And by extension, it is the story of the tribes of Native America. It emphasizes the creativity, community, and continuance of the Laguna Pueblo. And this is what Silco herself says. No matter what the future holds for the Laguna, Coyote will be there to disrupt things, to interject creative possibilities, and to teach the people that we all make mistakes, and sometimes really good stories come from those mistakes. Thank you.